I still have 30 seconds. <laughs> you know, you set your watches by when service is starting, when I'm doing it. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. And welcome everybody today. And we have guests from uh, the Gates Presbyterian Church. Right? I got it right? Oh, okay. You know. And because um, we often have visitors from different places, and we also have many visitors because tonight we're, we are celebrating Pride Shabbat. Uh, somebody says, well, mostly Pride was in June. How come you didn't do Pride in June? Rochester does it in July, so we'll, we're, we're in Rochester, guys and gals and everybody, and uh, we are celebrating Pride Shabbat. And somebody said, but you used to do it during Pride Week. And yeah, but there were other events that people wanted to go to on that Friday night. <laughs> so we proceeded by a day. It begins tomorrow, Pride Week. And we're glad you're here to celebrate with us. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Well, we'll start with Nigun. Uh, please join me, it's very simple. And the words are very simple too, la la la. La 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 ya la 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 ya la ya la la ya la 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 ya la 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 ya la 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 ya la 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 ya la 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 This is a first for me. Anybody know my first is? It's my first service doing with Rabbi Cantor Braun. 
that she's done services with Rabbi Till. She auditioned at a service with Rabbi Till. And so I am thrilled to have our new Cantor, Cantor Braun, Renata Braun, with us tonight. Um, and uh, as you see, she brings out the singing. And uh, so join in when you can. We'll turn to the sheets. We come together this Shabbat, each bringing to this sanctuary a private world of hopes, of fears, of dreams. Some of us are burdened by anxieties and cares that all but crash our faith in the future. Others have hearts filled with happiness, grateful for the joys of the past, we, yet aware that even the most fortunate are vulnerable before the mystery of tomorrow. Every life is a unique blending of joy and sorrow, of fulfillment and frustration. Beneath our uniqueness, we are all bound together by our common humanity. All of us most deeply yearn for the blessings of freedom and peace. Each of us seeks the personal liberation of a mind that is not enslaved to conventional wisdom, a heart that is able to love without fear, a spirit that cries yes to the universe. Each of us strives to the inner peace that comes with finding a harmony between our aspirations and our abilities. This is the Shabbat peace to which we aspire. Our synagogue is a stronghold of hope and inspiration, teaching us the holiness of life and inspiring in us a love for all humanity. In this synagogue, in the presence of the sacred, may our hearts be purified to worship together in sincerity and truth. We turn now to the kindling of the Shabbat candles. The blessing is on 121, but the reading is on the booklet page. Help me to perfect my ways of loving and caring. Inspire me to make myself whole so that I may honor your name and create a world of justice and peace. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kitshanu B'Mitzvotav, Tzivanu L'Hadim Shel Shabbat. Amen. Blessed are you, Adonai our God. who hallows us with mitzvot, commanding us to kindle the light of Shabbat. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, asher kishonu b'mitzvotav, v'tzivanu lehadik ner, lehadik ner, we turn in the prayer books to page 123 as we rise for the Kiddush, the sanctification of Shabbat over the wine. Amen. Ah. 
Chaim. You may be seated as we turn to page 124, and we will read responsibly. May the door of the synagogue be wide enough to receive all who hunger for love, all who are lonely for friendship. May the door of the synagogue be narrow enough to shut out pettiness and pride, envy and enmity. May it be too high to admit complacency, selfishness, and harshness. We turn now to Chadodi on page 138 and 139. The verses we do are 1, 2, 5, and 9. When we reach verse 9, we rise and we face the door to greet the Sabbath bride. Chadodi. Entrances to holiness are everywhere. The possibility of ascent is all the time. Even at unlikely times and through unlikely places, there is no place on earth without the present. <laughs> Israel, Bagala, Bagala, Uvisman Kari, Amen, Yeheshme Rabba Mevora, Leona Mulla Mehomaya, Yitba. Amen. Please rise as we turn to page 146 for the Barakul.
the sun sinks and the colors of the day turn, we offer a blessing for the twilight, for twilight is neither day nor night, but in between. We are all twilight people. We can never be fully labeled or defined. We are many identities and loves, many genders and none. We are in between roles at the intersection of histories or between place and place. We are crisscross paths of memory and destination, streaks of light and swirl together. We are neither day nor night. We are both neither and all. May the sacred in-between of this evening suspend our certainties, soften our judgments, and widen our vision. May this in-between light illuminate our way to the God who transcends all categories and definitions. May the in-between people who have come to pray be lifted up into the twilight. We cannot always define. We can always say a blessing. Blessed are you, God of all, who brings on the twilight. Together, you have loved the people Israel with a never-ending love. You have given us your Torah, laws, and statutes to guide us so that our lives may be filled with holiness and happiness. We know that we must find ways to strengthen our faith and hope in you. Our Torah acts as our inspiration. Help us, O oh God, to find ways to renew our commitments as Jews. Teach us to feel proud of all our for you, Eternal One, made us as we are. We say, praised are you, source of all, who is the lover of the people Israel. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai as we continue with Via Hafta 154. God did not lead us by the nearer way when Pharaoh let the people go at last, but round about by way of the wilderness, pillars of fire and cloud marking night and day to the edge of the flood tide, uncrossable and vast. If God had led us by the nearer way, we cried, we wouldn't die here. Let Egypt oppress us as it will. Let us return to the past, but we have come out by way of the wilderness. 
in fear, on faith, free now, because we say we are free, no longer the unchosen, the outcast. God did not lead us by the nearer way, but into rising waters which do not part, unless with an outstretched arm we step forward and stand fast, round about by way of the wilderness, we have come blessed with love, lesbian, gay, or sanctified in ways of our own, to bless our God who did not lead us by the nearer way, but round about by way of the wilderness. Page Please join me with Micha Mocha. We'll use the same tune that we use for Nigun, so that's gonna make it easier. Our people came out of Egypt, a mixed multitude, the spray of dividing water sparkling diamonds all around them. We stood together at Sinai, all of us, future, present, past, amid the rubble of thunder and the crack of bright lightning to enter the covenant with the one who loves us in whose shining image we are all created over and over again. We have wandered bleak landscapes built flimsy tents of skin in the houses of stone. We have planted orchards and vineyards, seen two temples rise and then go down in the surging flames, forcing us into exile. We have loved and lost, grieved and danced, transgressed and celebrated, hidden, suffered, thrived. And we gather here this day in the community of our people a mixed multitude, and we, and we sing out, Hear, O Israel, we stand together. All of us descendants of the single first human, created on the sixth day, and our myriad parents, <coughs> down through the generations, too numerous to name. We stand together, link arms, and pray. Blessed are you, God, of the universe, who sanctifies us with the commandment to love ourselves and one another in all our varied ways, and blesses us with a diamond bright radiance that still ripples out from your first spoken words of creation. Please join me for the Shamra on page 162. <laughs>
Shabbat Shalom, Yambri Bim Bam Bai, Shabbat Shabbat, Yambri Bim Bam Bai, Shabbat Shabbat, Shabbat Page 164 as we rise for the tefillah. Together on the sheets, Kedusha. 
There is holiness when we strive to be the best we know. There is holiness when we are kind to someone who cannot possibly be of service to us. There is holiness when we promote family harmony. There is holiness when we forget what divides us and remember what unites us. There is holiness when we are willing to be laughed at for what we believe in. There is holiness when we love truly, honestly, and unselfishly. There is holiness when we remember the lonely and bring cheer to the dark corner. There is holiness when we share our bread, our ideas, our enthusiasm. There is holiness when we gather to pray to God who gave us the power to pray. Please be seated. One of the most important teachings of the Torah is Viahavta Lurecha Kamocha, love your neighbor as yourself. There are no ifs, ands, or buts. We are commanded to love all members of the fabulous human family. In the creation account of the book of Genesis, God creates us Betzelim Elohim in God's image. That means that all of us, no matter our race, religion, gender, gender identity, nationality, economic status, disability, or sexual orientation, are reflections of the divine being who created us all. Therefore, when we act with love and compassion toward one another, we become holy. But holiness is not enough. Being holy means we become aware of our task to fix this broken world. The biblical prophets urge us on with their words, justice, justice shall you pursue. Pursuing justice means that we will keep working until our objectives are achieved, until we gain full civil rights for all, including marriage equality and non-discrimination protections across our country. Each one of us carries the divine spark within. And when these sparks come together, be they two sparks in marriage or many more sparks in community, there is that much more godliness in the world. Oh, that much more godliness in the world. Bigotry prevents the sparks from uniting, from joining one another, one, joining with other sparks. Bigotry and hatred keep people in their shells afraid. Bigotry is the absence of justice. So pursuing justice means dealing with bigotry head on. It means educating others about the diversity and beauty of God's creation. It means not being afraid of ourselves. It means letting our sparks shine as bright as they can. For where there is light, there is hope. And justice penetrates the dark. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaAlam Sheasanu Betzelim Elohim Praised are you, our God, ruler of the universe, who has made us, all of us, in your image as amazing, awesome, and wonderful creations. My God, I thank you for my life, my soul, and my body, for my name, for my sexual and affectionate nature, for my way of thinking and talking, help me realize that in my qualities I am unique in the world and that no one like me has ever lived. For if there had ever before been someone like me, I would not have needed to exist. Help me make perfect my own ways of love and caring, that by becoming perfect in my own way, I can honor your name and help bring about the coming of the Messianic Age. Shalom Rav is found on page 178. Shalom Rav Shalom Rav Yisrael Shalom, 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 Shalom,
Take a few moments of silent prayer, meditation. There are a couple of readings you might meditate on in the booklet or just pray from your own heart. Please join me with Beyado. You may find on page five on your handout. This beautiful setting is by contemporary Jewish composer Craig Tubman. Let's join together. Oh, no, I 
now turn our thoughts to those in need of healing. I'll read a prayer, say some names, and then if you have names that you would like to pray for, either say those names out loud as I look in your direction, or pray for them in your heart, and then we will sing, O oh God, my steps. Mishaberach, Avotenu v'imotenu, Avraham Yitzchak v'yakov, Sarah Rivka Rachel v'leya, Huyavarech et acholim. And the one who blessed our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, bless and heal all who are ill. Our thoughts turn to those in need of healing. We think of Jim Buran, Shana Esther Bat Rachel, Florence Sporn, Agnes Ege, Steve Brent, Barb DiCario, Haravadina Yehudit Bat Yaakov Mark Friedman, Patrick Dougherty, Jason Margulies, Jeffrey Kirsch, Lori Conrad. Are there any other names? May the Holy and Blessed One be filled with their compassion for their strength to be restored, their health to be renewed. May God send them renewal of body and spirit. May God grant strength to them, their loved ones, and their caretakers. And let us say, Amen. Please join me with, oh, guide my steps. Oh, guide my steps and help me find the way. I need you shelter now, rock me in your arms and guide my steps, and help me make this day a song of praise to you, rock me in your arms and guide my steps, oh guide my steps. When I was looking for a speaker for tonight and we had an idea of what we wanted to focus on, I saw Dr. Kevin McGowan and I said, uh, Kevin, do you have anybody? He's the uh, superintendent, for those know, don't know, of uh, Brighton Schools. And he said, there's one person. This is the person you have to go and ask to come and speak. Dr. Emma Forbes Jones is a clinical psychologist whose goal is to help children, adolescents, and young adults utilize their strength to become more competent and confident and to support parents as they help their children grow. She has trained in the diagnosis and treatment of psychological, emotional, behavioral, and interpersonal problems in children, adolescents, and young adults. She has expertise working with gender identity and sexuality concerns, mood and anxiety disorders, behavioral concerns, learning or academic concerns and adjustments to life stressors, including adoption, divorce and illness, and death of family members. Dr. Forbes Joan is a graduate of Barnard College. She took her MA and her PhD here at University of Rochester, and she did her postdoctoral training and residency at a fellowship in adolescent medicine at University of Rochester, and an internship in child and adolescent psychiatry here again at the University of Rochester. She's adjunct faculty member of U University of Rochester Medical Center and Department of Psychiatry, and a member of the World Professional Association of Transgender Health. 
We welcome to our BIMA Dr. Emma Forbes-Jones. Thank you for being here. Thank you for that. When I hear it all spelled out in one place, it's a little overwhelming, I have to say. <laughs> all right. I, um, though a whole bunch of things that I do was listed in that kind introduction, really at this point and probably for the last three to four years or so, only see people who have gender expansive behaviors and identities. So I meet with a lot of small children all the way up through, I think the oldest person I met was 81. The bulk of the people I see, however, are teenagers and young adults. Um, so I wanted to just spend some time talking about this because I know it is, seems like a big burst of things that's happening all around us. Um, certainly we're all hearing about it a lot more. So gender is everywhere. Most of us start our lives with gender being the first label we acquire, often now in the age of ultrasounds, before we're even born. Our clothes are gendered, our speech and language is gendered, our body language is gendered. When we meet a stranger, our brains make two important judgments within milliseconds. Is this person safe? Is this person male or female? And our brains, for whatever reason, have really only two options for each of those questions. Gender is a binary concept, and this has been reinforced by culture and socialization man or woman, boy or girl. This is one of the very first gender rules that's learned by the time people are in preschool. The fact that there are two and only two choices. But there are other rules too, like gender is assigned at birth by a doctor who takes a peek between the legs and once assigned, it can't be changed. Other rules sometimes include the notion that one gender is better than another that pink is for girls and blue is for boys, that men can be firefighters and women can be nurses, that girls, when assertive, are called bossy, and boys, when assertive, are demonstrating good leadership skills. There are many more rules, and the more you look for them, the more you will see. These rules define and reinforce this gender binary and become internalized, often at a very young age. Behavior that breaks these rules is gender transgressive. It has been medicalized, legislated against, met with social ostracization, shunning, violence, and even death. What most of us have all learned about sex and gender, the rules we've learned from our families, from school, from faith communities, from the media, and none of it is true. There is a broad middle space between the two ends of the binary that is filled with unimaginable diversity. When I'm working with families, I like to show them a picture. I'm a very visual thinker, so I usually move my hands and use pictures. I like to show them a picture of what I call the gender-bred person. So I want you all to imagine kind of a gingerbread kind of cookie, and it's got four areas labeled. The brain, the heart, the private area, and then there's the icing, of course. The brain is where gender identity lives. Gender identity is a person's deeply held sense of their gender as male, female, both, neither, or something else entirely. We do not choose our gender identities. Rather, they emerge from within. It's believed to be an inherent characteristic of someone and cannot be regulated or determined by others. It can often be difficult to understand what gender identity is because it's such an intrinsic part of who we are. Because it's deeply personal and privately understood, it can be difficult to think of it as a distinct aspect of who we are and equally challenging to articulate the sense of who we are to someone else. The tendency is to try and equate gender identity with other aspects of gender and self, like body parts, personal expression, sexual attraction, or even personality. It is essentially each of us, each of how, how each of us perceives ourselves to be. Back to our, gen, our gender-bred person. The space between the gender-bred person's legs signifies biological sex. Sex is a biological concept, and it's typically determined by our chromosomal makeup. When we were all in about maybe seventh grade, 
we were taught that there are two options for sex, right? There's XY chromosomes, which make boys, and there are XX chromosomes, which make girls. We now know, though, that there are more than 50 ways for those chromosomes to come together to create an amazing diversity in biological sex. You got your XXYs, you got your XYX, and so on and so forth. We call these intersex conditions. And in fact, the population rate of those born with intersex conditions is about the same as the population rate of those born with red hair. And I bet you most of us know someone with red hair. The heart on our genderbred person stands for attraction. It's completely different from the other three things. Attraction is about who we want to be with and says nothing about who we are. And then finally, gender expression, or the decorative icing on our gender bed person, is how we express our gender, the clothes we wear, the way we wear our hair, the way we use language or adopt or don't adopt gender roles. People who are gender non-conforming vary in their gender expression or gender role from conventional norms. An example of this may be a boy who likes to wear nail polish, or back in the olden days, a girl who refused to wear dresses. He still identifies his gender as boy, and she still identifies her gender as girl. Most of gender expression is determined by cultural norms and can differ from place to place and across time. The word transgender, or trans, describes individuals who have a gender identity that is not fully congruent with the sex they were assigned at birth. There are an infinite number of diverse identities and expressions, and no one way to be transgender. Many transgender people seek some degree of medical intervention to align themselves with the gender with which they identify, but not all do. A transgender woman or girl is someone who is assigned male at birth and who identifies and can appear as female. A transgender man or boy is someone who is assigned female at birth, but who identifies and can appear as male. Gender queer or gender non-binary non -binary are terms used by individuals who don't identify as either male or female, or who identify as both male and female, or who fall somewhere else in, in the galaxy in some other non-binary way. The word we use for people who are not gender expansive, whose identities and biology are congruent, is cisgender. The kids these days have about 4,537 other terms to further differentiate their identities, and the language is constantly evolving, and I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> we don't really know how many transgender people there are in the world. Rates range from about 0.6% to 3%, depending on geographic area, culture, and how we ask the question. For example, the largest number of American transgender adults live in Hawaii it's likely that there aren't actually more trans people in Hawaii, but rather more people who are comfortable answering a survey question that identifies them as such. Recent data suggests that about 2% of school-age children and youth identify as transgender or genderqueer. Any parent in my office who has a teen who's recently disclosed their own gender identity issues is fairly convinced that the internet has had some influence on their child. It feels like there's been a sudden burst in the appearance of trans children and youth, that it's maybe cool to be transgender and that everyone is doing it. A more plausible explanation is that with the internet and the ability to see and connect with people outside of our own bubbles comes the realization that transgender identities exist that being who you are is actually possible. When I work with older trans adults, those in their 50s or beyond, many of them express that they knew they felt different, but didn't know it was possible to live any other way than in the body they were in, and that being any other way carried with it such enormous cost that pursuing a change seemed terrifying. Remember, there are consequences for breaking the rules. Now, more youth see what's possible, have the language oftentimes to talk about what they're feeling and are no longer as isolated. Many of these, and I've heard them called outbreaks, in local schools, and by outbreak I mean three or four kids in a school district when five years ago there were, as far as anybody knew, none. They're the result of one child coming out, being visible, and then those who may never have had the courage to do the same can also be visible. I tell the kids that this is their superpower. 
One of my working tenets is that you can't be what you can't see. And as visibility increases, so will the ability of others to take risks and be visible themselves. This really is what pride is all about. But being visible is still risky. It is still really breaking the rules. And teens are well aware of the consequences of breaking the rules. It is still the case that transgender individuals live in a world that's not designed to recognize and accept them. It's this struggle which creates the clinical diagnosis of gender dysphoria, which is the persistent distress with physical characteristics at signed at birth and what the presence of those characteristics signify to the rest of the world. So when I'm working with people, does everyone remember what a Venn diagram is, those two overlapping circles, right? I ask people to imagine a Venn diagram. And one circle we label physical, and the other one we label so social. Physical dysphoria is what one would feel alone on a desert island. And I tell the teens they can take their pets and their music, but that's it. <laughs> How comfortable are you with your body? How gender accurate does it feel to you? The other circle is social dysphoria. It's the act of walking around in that body and people's responses to who they think you are. It's being called miss at the restaurant when you identify as a boy. It's being called young man at school when you identify as a girl. It's being called Sally when you feel like a John or being referred to as he when you're actually a she. One client of mine said, so I'm constantly putting out these messages that express my gender, which by the way, most of us don't have to do in a conscious way. Sometimes I'm not even aware of it, but that's only half the story. How these signals are interpreted by others is their perception of my gender. I'm finding that when my gender is correctly identified by strangers, it's easier to navigate going to the grocery store. I feel safer and more comfortable. However, I sometimes have the experience of being misgendered by well-meaning strangers, and this can be upsetting. As you can imagine, the costs of breaking these gender rules takes a toll. And the adversity experienced by trans people is staggering. <coughs> Excuse me. 57% of transgender adults have experienced family rejection. 53% report having been verbally harassed in a public place. 26% report having lost a job. 19% have been refused housing. Another 19% have been refused medical care. In K through 12 schools, 78% of gender expansive kids report having been harassed. 35% report having been physically assaulted. 12% report sexual assault. About half report skipping classes or missing school at least once in the last month because it felt unsafe. As you may imagine, these kids are at risk for substance use, anxiety and depressive disorders, eating disorders, and academic failure. Most alarmingly though, is that 43% of trans adults in one study report having made a suicide attempt that required medical intervention. So these are pretty serious. Most frequently during adolescence. In another study, half of the trans teens report having seriously considered taking their lives. In 2015, there were more than 20 publicized youth suicides, and I stopped keeping track in October that year. Layla Alcorn was one of these teens. She died by suicide at the age of 16, and she left a note that was found shortly after she died. And I wanted to just read a snippet from that. I'm never going to transition successfully, even when I move out. I'm never going to be happy with the way I look or sound. I'm never going to have enough friends to satisfy me. I'm never going to have enough love to satisfy me. I'm never going to find a man who loves me. I'm never going to be happy. Either I live the rest of my life as a lonely man who wishes he were a woman, or I live my life as a lonelier woman who hates herself. There's no winning. There's no way out. I'm sad enough already. I don't need my life to get any worse. People say it gets better, but that isn't true in my case. It gets worse. Each day, I get worse. So that's the gist of it. That's why I feel like killing myself. Sorry if that's not a good enough reason for you. It's good enough for me. The only way I will rest in peace is if one day transgender people aren't treated the way I was, when they're treated like humans with valid feelings and human rights. Gender needs to be taught about in schools. The earlier, the better. My death needs to mean something. 
My death needs to be counted in the number of transgender people who commit suicide this year. I want someone to look at that number and say, that's messed up, and fix it. Fix society, please. Now I gotta go where it. So what can be done? Well, there's a lot. First and foremost, we build nests. When we have nests to return to, which are safe and cozy and well-lined with the understanding and respect which we all deserve, the storms raging out there are manageable. One nest can be enough. You can leave for a bit, fly around, then come back. More nests are better. They allow for longer flights and bigger adventures. Homes need to be nests. In fact, when families are accepting, the suicide attempt rate in transgender teens goes down to what we see in the general population. Schools and faith communities need to be nests. In a nest, your name is always correct. Your pronouns are always right. In a nest, you can pee where you want. You can wear what you want. Paint your nails if you want. Wear combat boots or boots with high heels. You can be yourself. I encourage all of you to ponder your own experiences with gender. This is a challenging thing which many of us, most of us, I would argue, have never had to do. When did you realize you were a boy? Do you remember an aha moment? How did you learn how to be a woman? And what being a woman, being a woman means? How would you describe your gender without describing your clothes or your behaviors? This is hard, and this, that thing, that's your gender identity. We have so much left to learn, and our best teachers are the teens themselves. This, though, I know. A person is who they say they are, and when it doesn't match up to what I expect, I start building a nest, because without them, life is awfully hard. I encourage you all to build nests of your own, to ask someone what their pronouns are if it's not immediately evident, to be curious and loving with those who are breaking those gender rules instead of condemning them. That is how we start to fix society. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for sharing and, and expanding our own knowledge and uh, just teach us how to be in that here because that's what we want to be and that's what we hope to be. We're going to continue now with our service. Anybody under the age of 13 out there? I don't think so. Not how you act, not how you act. Okay, so we'll turn to now the Alenu. The Alenu is found on page 586. We begin with the second paragraph on that page, then we go to 588 and 591. Please rise. Shahamayim, Bimah, Vialha, 
Rent me all hearts, me God, remember today our LGBTQ siblings who were martyred in years past, those murdered by fanatics in the Middle Ages, those who perished in the Holocaust, and those struck down in our own city in our own time. Remember also those who took their lives, driven by despair by a world that hated them because of their love or gender. And in mercy, remember those who lived lives of loneliness, repressing their true natures and refraining from sharing their love with one another. O oh God, remember the sacrifice of these martyrs and help us bring an end to hate and oppression of every kind. We also this Shabbat think of our loved ones whom death has recently taken from us, those who died this season in years past, and those who we have drawn into our hearts with our own. This Shabbat we extend sympathies to those who are in the first 30 days of mourning the Shloshim period, for Stephen Frankel, the brother of Neil Frankel, and Ruth Krauss, the mother of Ron Krauss. We also remember the yard sites, the anniversaries of the deaths of Nathaniel Bedanes, Milton Battler, Solomon Bensman, Eva Burke, Edgar Bissett, Morton Brodsky, Irving Kramer, Betty Dunsker, Francis Earn, Pauline Fletcher, Rhoda Goldstein, Leslie Gould Bruner, Rose Grossman, Alexander Hutkoff, Gerald Martin Kahn, Dorothy Kellerman, Ray Lakin, Erwins Levy, Hyman Lisson, Arthur Loeb, Jocelyn Phillips, Rose Polanski, Isidore Rapkin, and Rosalie Reardon. Are there any other names of recent deaths or yard sites that anyone would like to share? Zichronam Nevracha, may their memories all be for blessing. The Mourner's Kaddish is found on page 598. Yitgadal v'yitgadash shemei rabah, v'yalma divrach irutei v'yamlich malchutei, v'chayei chon v'yomei chon v'chayei d'chol b'yit Yisrael, b'agala v'zman tari v'yemru amen. Yehei Shmei Raba Mevarach Leolam Lalme Omaya Yit Barach Vishtabach Vit Baar Vit Romam Vit Nase Vit Adar Vit Ale Vit Alal Shmeid Kudisha Brichu La Ela Min Kol Birchata Vishirata Tush Bichata Venechemata Da Amiran Mialma Vimru Ame Yehei Shlama Raba Min Shemaya Bechayim aleinu v'yalkod Yisrael v'yimru amen O se shalom b'mromav v'ya se shalom aleinu v'yalkod Yisrael v'yalkod yoshvei tevel v'yimru amen May God who creates peace in the heavens above let peace descend on us and all Israel and all humanity throughout the earth and let us say together Amen May the source of peace and peace to those who mourn and comfort to the bereaved amongst us Please be seated. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce our greeter from our Board of Trustees, Carla Greenfield. Carla is here to greet you and answer questions. So if you have questions, she'd be glad to uh, find an answer or give you an answer or know an answer or make up an answer, whatever you want. Whatever you want, it's fine. Uh, our custom here is to greet each other with a Shabbat Shalom, which is the Sabbath greeting. Again, for the friends from uh, the Gates Presbyterian Church, I, the occasional words I guess I didn't translate. And it's a Sabbath greeting, and you try to find someone near you that you don't know, and greet, you, greet them and, and introduce yourself and say hello to somebody. Shabbat shalom.
Okay, so following the service, you now have a new friend to share the joys of Shabbat, the Oneg Shabbat, and the goodies that are in the social hall after the service. So please do that. I just want to mention that um, next week, um, oh, tomorrow, there is Bagels and Bible at Temple Sinai at 915. Next Friday, Shabbat services at 6 p.m. And next Saturday, Bagels and Bible 915. And then we are participating in the Pride Parade next Saturday. We gather around 12 o'clock, and we, our number is... This is great. 70. Okay, there's 134 different groups, but 70 is the age of wisdom. What? No, 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 oh, that's right. Oh, yes. No, I didn't mean that, I didn't mean that. Okay. For others, it's the age of wisdom. And um, it is also um, a full life, and it's just a great number for us to have. Um, so we are number 70, so I hope you'll come out and march with us or some other group that you're affiliated with. It's important that we go out and march and celebrate. It's really a, a really great time. And then if you had fun at that, you can go to the Red Wings gang on August 12th with the group. And uh, I don't know what section we're in then, but it's not 70. Um, so before we uh, go back to the social hall, we say the mozi over the chala. By the way, for those of you who are in the um, Schmuzen, uh, there was a rainbow column that Blanche Fenster, our president of the back of the room, uh, prepared for us. And uh, I know who made this challah, so uh, I. Baruch atah adonai, Any good news anybody has? Jewish Film Festival is still on. Monday night is the one about baseball, you know, I mean, really the important things. And I know two people who are not the traditional major league players in that film, our dear friend David Leishman, who many of you met when you were in Israel at his kibbutz, and his son Alon, who actually works for Major League, one of the, I think, the Seattle Mariners organization, and played for Team Israel, and was one of the two Israeli-born um, players on Team Israel. And that's really important stuff. We're ready for our closing song. <laughs> Anybody else have any good news? Okay, we'll turn to page 647. Many of you know the words, O se shalom. O se shalom bimrama. O se shalom bimrama. 